Uh, today we have Noorain, who's a senior lecturer at Sunway University. Uh, she did her PhD in uh, regional science with a focus on specialization in economics from Cornell. Uh, she's previously held positions at the Asian Development Bank in Philippines, uh, as well as at the Central Bank. So I guess it's kind of like coming home for you today. Uh, she was also a visiting scholar at the Asia Center at Harvard. Uh, and today she's going to be telling us something about uh, currency contagion in uh, emerging market, which is uh, joint work with Zaheer Anwar and uh, Ishak Bhatt. Bhatt? Ishak Bhatti. Bhatti. Yeah. Uh, um, and yeah, no, we have uh, one hour. Uh, and yeah, typically we ask questions along the way. Yeah, uh, sure. And at the end of the seminar, again, hopefully we'll have some time for any uh, leftover questions and discussion. Okay. So sure. the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. Maybe I'll we'll just extend. It's easier, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Okay, so good morning, everyone. First of all, uh, thank you for being here for my presentations. So I have another two colleagues actually coming uh, afterwards. Uh, so the topic of my presentation today is on dynamic spectral analysis of currency contagion in emerging markets during crisis period and crisis period here referring to the COVID-19 and Russia in war. And so this is the paper uh, by myself, Zahir Anwar and Prof. Ishabati here. So the outline of my presentation, first I will start with the motivations of embarking on this paper, followed by the research questions, the objectives, the literature review, data and methodology, results and analysis, and finally the conclusions. Okay, so what is the motivations? So the motivations is none other than the history of the Asian financial crisis in 1997 and 1998. So when the Thai buck devalued on the 2nd of July, it triggers a chain of reaction in Southeast Asia and beyond. So Malaysia intervened to defend the ringgit from plunging on the 10th of July. Philippines peso devalued uh, nine days later on the 11th of July. Indonesia abandoned its rupiah trading bans and allowed the free floating on August 14, almost a month later. And then Hong Kong landed lending rate astronomically increased to 300% on October 23rd. And this was followed by Korean bond that plunged to a new low on October 28th. And then the Russian ruble as well, the, current, the crisis has culminated in the Russian ruble plunge with astronomical interest rates high of 150% uh, on May the next following year in 1998. So this has ignited global financial meltdown. So this is our first motivation, the history of the Asian financial crisis in 1997-1998. Then the second motivation is not other, it's new to us, the ringgit depreciations and movement for the past couple, for the past months, right? So if you see here, this is taken from the Bloomberg at the beginning of the year, this is where the index for the ringgit is. And six months later, we did has depreciated roughly about 6%. Okay, so the research that we embark uh, is trying to explore what drives this movement in the currency market, right? Is this movement driven by the speculators or is it driven by the genuine investors? And if it's driven by the speculators, how long does it take for the speculators to attack? And how long do they start to like, you know, retreat back the attack? And if it's driven by the genuine investors, then how long or when would the genuine investors come into the currency market? And how long would they uh, remain in this currency market? So this is pretty much like the research that we are trying to explore here. Yes. Uh, and just for context, when we were talking about the Asian financial crisis of 97-98, what was like extent of devaluation that happened in the ringgit or the baht or uh, the... <laughs> <laughs> how much did the currency devalue in that time period? Like in the value of, say, the Thai baht, did it fall plunge by a huge amount? Yeah, it was really huge. I think, if I'm not mistaken, 1,805 baht to the US dollar went down to roughly about 20,000. Okay, and wow. So it was like a 20 yes. first time reduction. So basically, a it huge was, fall in yes, value. Yeah. It was really huge. And then I think when I mentioned about on the 10th of July, when the central bank actually intervened in the forex market to defend the currency, yeah. it is more like an intervention that is significant that it depleted a lot, large amount of the forex reserve. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but you can't stop this contagion from happening. Okay, from one country falling to another country. So you can't, you can't stop this thing. So now the research questions that we're looking at is uh, did currency contagion occur in the 20 emerging market currencies during the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russian Ukraine war? If yes, what type of contagion? Is it pure contagion 
or is it fundamentals based pathogen? And if yes, as well, the current pathogen actually exists, what is the speed of this pathogen and its persistency? Now, the second research question that we ask is what is the impact on 20 emerging market currencies when there is a shock to the Chinese one because the COVID 19 started with China? A shock to Russian Google. Is there any impact on these 20 emerging market currencies? The last one we explore instead of like country of origin shocks, could the impact actually on this currency market for me is from uncertainty in the Chicago Board and Options Exchange, good old volatility, CBO gold volatility, CBO volatility, and there's one more that is the US. Treasury deal, then there's US Treasury deal volatility that I left off here. Okay. So these are the three research questions that we are exploring. Now, what is the objectives? We want to investigate the type of currency contingent in the 20 emerging market countries during the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russian Ukraine war. And we wanted to investigate the speed and dynamic of contingent from the detection of COVID-19 virus in China to when Russian Ukraine war broke. And finally, we wanted to invest in the reduction of these 20 emerging market currencies, the movement in Chinese yuan and Russian ruble, and then at the same time, to the movement in their volatility indices. Okay. So let's move to the theoretical framework underlying this currency contingent. So the theoretical framework underlying currency contingent can be traced back to the three generation model of currency contingent, the three generation model of currency. So the first generation model of currency from Krugman 1979, he said that when you have a country with a fixed exchange rate and weak fundamentals, weak domestic fundamentals, that high fiscal deficit, for example, then you breed a fertile ground for speculators to attack your currency. So that is the first generation model of currency condition. Now, the second generation model of currency condition that came to from Oswald 1994, he stated that it doesn't matter whether you have good fundamentals or you have the bad fundamentals, but when there is the exogenous shocks of market psychology that can happen through self-fulfilling prophecy, hurting behavior, or cascading informations, then investors will just treat all these countries as homogeneous. They are not going to differentiate the heterogeneity of one country from another country. They are not going to take into account the symmetric informations or national specificity or the fundamentals of the country, but they're going to treat all these countries as homogeneous. That was the second generation model by Oxford and So these second generation models then are all based on the assumptions of some kind of behavioral uh, deviation from, for, from rationality or foresight. Uh, that one is supported by the um, by the theory of behavioral finance. The theory of behavioral finance then lends the support that the herding behavior of mimicking the action of other investors, regardless of whether these investors are they are acting in a rational way or irrational way, it is just the herding behaviors. Okay. Mm. And and that's what you refer to as pure contagion. Then that is nothing to do with the fundamentals; it's purely to do with misplaced beliefs. Yes, correct. Mm. So the pure contagion, that means the, the pure contagion is usually done by the speculators. They would come immediately, regardless of you know whatever the shocks there is, whatever the fundamentals of the country is, come in, attack, sell, trading, and stuff like that. And then after that, they will pull up. So it was a immediate uh, uh, speculators uh, action. Okay. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Just have one question on the speculative attack that you mentioned. Is there any difference with, between the speculative attacks and just rational behavior from the lenders, in the sense from the from the investors, in the sense that countries with higher deficits are more likely to to suffer crisis or to leverage the currency in the future, so they try to diversify and maybe they take out the capital from these countries? Or how do you differentiate this behavior with a speculative attacks or uh, Okay, so we distinguish the, the two behaviors of the speculators and the genuine investors. So the speculators is in the category of the pure contagion. So the moment shocks happen, they will just react because they don't want to be the last one to leave the market and they don't want to be the last one to run the loss. So they will just follow the behaviors of others. 
So that is the speculators. And later we found out that the speculators, uh, if let's say the abnormality of the currency here is in the short term, and that is due to the pure contagion driven by the speculators. The genuine investors, on the other hand, we found that they will evaluate the fundamentals of the country. And from our finding here, it shows that they will start to react 16 days later. So roughly about two weeks, then the genuine investors, they have time to evaluate the fundamentals of the country and they will react 16 days later. I'm sorry, in the data, how do you identify a speculator from a true investors? Uh, so the reaction. So we that one uh, we classic we we classify the speculators as the one that comes in for the short term. Okay. Yeah. And the genuine investors is the one that comes in for the long term. Long term. Okay, maybe you will tell us a bit more about the methodology and then it will become yes. clearer what you mean by short and long term. Yes, okay. the short term and the long term. The threshold for the short term and long term varies across the studies. But in ours, what we follow is study by and Hong, and we don't want to um, to be conservative and extreme by saying that, oh, two weeks, beyond two weeks, it is long term. Even though, as you can see, in the timeline of the event, in my motivation one, is just take the next 10 days for the chain of reaction to take place. But then in this paper, we followed like several studies that we put the threshold of like 30 days, one month. So if let's say it continues beyond these 30 days, then that is due to the genuine investors that they have started to react. Continues, what continues beyond 30 days? Uh, that means the genuine investors will start to follow suit and they will start to relinquish and selling off the, that particular country's currency and start to pull out from the market. First, it was the reactions of the speculators, immediate reactions of the speculators, and how long would these immediate reactions of the speculators will take place? Okay. Right? So then, uh, will genuine investors follow suit or not? That's the question. Because genuine investors, they are in for the FDI for long term. Yeah. So, but they will start to evaluate the fundamentals of the country eventually, according to our finding, 16 days later. And then only they will start to make the decisions. Should we continue to invest this in the long term or should we slowly, slowly start to like sell off our positions in this country? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if, but yeah, maybe I'm pre jumping, but I'm still trying to understand. Like, suppose I was a, I was a genuine investor, which is very well informed of the fundamentals of this country. You know, I've been tracking it for a long time. The shock happens. Yeah. I know. I don't need to wait, you know, and know I need to pull it out because I understand the setting very perfectly. Yes, right. And so I move very quickly and within the second day I pull it out, for instance. But then you would classify me as being a speculator, no? That's correct. Because the genuine investors, you are here, you put in a lot of investment, you set up your factories, or maybe you have the long-term plan of being here in the country, and you can't, you are not going to take that loss of just simply pulling out in a day. You're here for the long term. Okay. Yeah. No, uh, maybe I'll come back to it later. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So then, uh, more studies here on the currency contingent covers Asian financial crisis 97, 98, and among others, Forbes and Govan 2002, Lee and Azali 2010, so May and Wong 2008, or the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, uh, such as Croatia and Atta 2020, Park and Song 2001. So the methodology that we're going to use here, instead of using the standard econometrics technique, we are using what we call the wavelength analysis, which I will show later. And because we don't use the standard econometrics technique because they have the heterocardasticity bias and it is not dynamic. Heterocardasticity bias, that means over the period of time, when you have the variance that keep on increasing, you won't be able to capture that variance, that volatility that increase over time. Because in the econometric planning, you assume that it, it is invariant, one number that represents the volatility. And that is the average throughout the period that you're looking for. Okay, so we use wavelength analysis instinct to capture the dynamic of the volatility, the dynamic of the variance, the dynamic of the correlations. Okay, the data and methodology. Okay, so this is what you're waiting for. So the data that we use is daily exchange rates data on 20 emerging market currencies. They come from EICON Vista streams that started from September 2019 to June 2023. And the method that we use is what we call wavelength analysis. 
in the wavelet analysis, there are wavelet power spectrum that captures the dynamic variance. Dynamic means that the variance that keep on changing over the period of time, we capture that. And we also have wavelet coherence. Wavelet coherence will capture the dynamic cross correlation. In this case, the 20 emerging market and how it correlates with the Chinese one because the COVID-19 started in China and the dynamic correlation of these 20 emerging market currencies with the Russian ruble because the Russian Ukraine war started in Russia. Okay, so the idea is instead of looking at the graphs that you have when you plot the currency graph, the returns on the currency graph that oscillates up and down, instead of looking at it from two dimensions, time and volatility and aesthetic, let's look at it from the three-dimension perspective. And this three-dimension is time, frequency, period. And this is when it happens, how long will it last? That shocks. And the amplitude, the power. So it can last long, but then it's not that strong, it's not abnormal uh, currency volatility. It can last long, but it is not abnormal uh, cross-correlations uh, movement between the Chinese one and that particular emerging market currency. So that is captured by the power. So this wavelet analysis, okay, uh, is commonly used in the EEG, electro and characteristically, that's what EEG stands for, um, studies to capture and interpret the intricate pattern of the brainwave activities. Right. So I'm sure you have seen, uh, you know, the picture where they put the EEG uh, device to the head. Sometimes there's also the similar device that they put to the heart as well to capture, you know, the oscillations of the brain activities. Okay. Right. So actually, this wavelet analysis is the signal processing techniques, signal processing techniques to explore the time the frequency and the amplitude, the power of the data that we have received. So the technique that was used to take the pattern of the brain activities here, that same technique that we apply because the currency return exhibits the oscillations pattern, just like what the brain wave activities are. Okay, so that is the wave analysis. Are there any questions? What do I get out of the wavelet analysis? Do I get coefficients that I interpret or okay, just okay, okay. So there will be the results. Okay. Okay, so this is I think the results. Yes, this is what you'll get. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the results. So this is the signaling processing techniques, right? So what do you get? You get the X exists here that shows the time when it happened. Okay, this is sub samples of what I have. Remember, I have 20 emerging market currencies. And the Y exists here is the period. How long does it take? So, for example, here I have four. That means that uh, shocks happen only for four days. And then it can go up until eight days, 16 days, 32 days, and up until 456 days that we have set in our, uh, in our method here. Okay. So, sorry, just a clarifying question. You measure shock as just a deviation from the mean for a for a certain number of periods or something like that. Or how do you measure a shock on the? On the... We have the current. We, so when you plot the, uh, okay, let me get back to the process in one second. Let me just explain what the the x exists, the y exists of this data first, right? So the x exists here is the time period when it happened. So the period between two hundred and four hundred here was when the COVID nineteen first started. Okay, when WHO announced the what was it the um movement control order across the world so that was the period between 200 and 400 so you can see you see between 200 and 400 for the indonesia case here the like the heightened color in red here from this period of zero until the period of like 128 here you see uh, so it heightened you can see it's not everywhere showing the same color patches the red patches shows that the heightened volatility that is above the normal volatility of that particular currency, okay? And it happened that when we extract out the volatility, the oscillations that they, that heightened volatility exhibited between the period of 200 and 400 here, which captured the period when COVID-19 happened. 
Okay, and then the period of between 800 and 1000 here, this was when Russia Ukraine war happened. So you see, and during other periods, you don't see this heightened volatility happening. Okay, we didn't, there is no shocks here yet. It's just that floppy, that wave that we have uh, calculated the return of the currency. And we identify that the red pressure appear when the COVID 19 happened and during the Russian Ukraine war. Okay? Now, the second observation is that for some, this red patch lasted only until 32 days. For some here, for example, 16 days. For some, it can go until, let's say this one here, 32 days for Malaysia here during the COVID period. For Indonesia, on the other hand, it goes up until 128 days. So the preliminary conclusion here, we haven't confirmed yet with our um, our supporting findings afterwards. So the preliminary finding here shows that when the volatility is exhibited only for short-term period, this is due to the speculators working on it. But then when it lasted longer than what is supposed to be, then the genuine investors start to react. So I will... I will how did you make this conclude so and also to get back to augustine's yeah. question what is the so that you suggest is like a deviation what is the deviation in relation to uh it's the long term i think so in the model when we calculate the wave analysis i think they take it from the long term uh trend of the volatility for that particular currency and then during this period uh it is higher than this long term trend i think mm -hmm. yeah and it heightens during the uh between the period of 200 and 400 and this captured the period of the uh, COVID-19 and then above beyond 800 and above this was when Russia became more happened okay yeah for the case of Malaysia for example can we identify the period uh, between 2014 and 2015 where they really suffered like a huge depreciation yes can yeah, we can. yeah we can but then in this um in this analysis, I didn't take until 2014 because my my research objective was to look at what happened during COVID-19 and the Russian Ukraine war. But you can do the same thing as well. Um, okay, so here you are showing these two periods, the yes, financial yes. crisis and the yes. But then if you're interested to know, uh, to know, I have my GitHub, so I can show to you how to run it on the app. Okay. Yeah, I think the programming is there. So you just need to load the data, adjust the dates, and it can turn out this nice graph like this. Yeah, okay. I think it looks nice. Uh, so the time axis is convertible to date, right? Yes, correct. The time axis here, actually, I have, um, uh, yeah, the time axis is actually the dates. Somehow in there, it won't be able to capture the specific dates. It will make it a bigger. Uh, uh, so, but then in our paper, when we read, when we wrote, we have the time, um, the corresponding time to each of these period. So the hotter color is more volatile. Yes, correct. More high, higher probability. Yes. And what what wavelet you use? Uh, wavelet analysis. So we have the wavelet. Uh, so this one here will be the wavelet power spectrum because what wavelet power spectrum captures the dynamic wavelets. Uh, sorry, dynamic variance. If you have wavelet coherence, that will capture dynamic correlations. So this one here. Okay, remember our first research questions was to identify um the speculators' behavior and the uh genuine investors' behavior, and if there is possibility the currency condition okay now and so if i look at this graph and we're saying malaysia ends at 32 and is not red anymore what does it mean it just means that after that it went back to its mean yeah so the the volatility in the currency market in malaysia during the covid it dampens off after 32 days but not during the russian ukraine war so during the russian ukraine war you can see it heightened until 32 days then there was a short break and then after that it continues back from this uh, 32 days onwards. And what if I was to just take the data on volatility and calculate just a simple uh, devariant deviation from the mean? It would be static, static, right? In what sense would it be static? Uh, because you calculate the variance, then the variance is you sum all, is of course it's mean, right? Then you get one particular number. But this one here is dynamic, right? It's across the period of time. The variation here is across the period of time. Yeah, and, but I could calculate it at every point of time, even the mean averages, no? Like I could say what was the volatility volatility on 
day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven, because you said the volatility is always being compared to a static baseline of long term trend. And if I was to plot it, how would it look any different than this wave? You're, you're taking the moving, the thing is it, the moving, uh, moving average standard deviations. For, yeah, yeah, if you would like say for a five day window, for instance, I did that and I would plot it, would it look any different okay. from this? So, okay. Okay. I'm still trying to understand what yes, do yes, I gain yes. methodologically yeah. from this approach, you know, I have no idea about it. That's why I'm kind of trying to mm -hmm. wrap my head around what are the, what's the assumptions okay. underlying the structure. Yeah, you can calculate that. It will give you, okay, if you calculate the variance itself, you're going to get a static positive number because the variance is actually the summation of each data points above its mean, right? So the variance itself. But if you're going to calculate, like, okay, let's say moving average standard deviations, that like you say, okay, I'm going to take, let's say, five rolling moving average. Mm -hmm. So five days above is long term trend. Then I got this one variance. And then the next following five days above this trend. So I get this one trend. So when you plot, you are going to plot, um, you're going to plot against, let's say, time period. Yeah. Right? So you may have going up, going down, you don't know. But then can it tells you the power of this volatility? Yeah. At which point would this volatility, yeah, you may see it's higher or may see it's lower. Yeah. Okay, then maybe you can infer that, oh, this one here during this period, I have much higher volatility. Yes. But can you tell that volatility is significant or not? Whether it is 95% significant or not? I'm sure I could run a test, no? You can go ahead, but here. <laughs> <laughs> So what should we take from, from here that the periods that are very red is periods of very high volatility yes. and they are statistically significant. Yes, correct. And but from here can we distinguish between the real investors and the and the speculative investors or from here we still cannot do that? No, yes, right? Yes, we can. Because it depends on the threshold that you put in. So for example, I put in the threshold of 32 days and I said whatever that is happening less than 32 days, oh. this is the speculator's okay. behavior. Whatever that is more than 32 days, this is the genuine investor's behavior. And this was done by Meng and Wang and one more study, I think that they put that threshold. But you can see other studies, they have different thresholds. So we just wanted to be more conservative. Let's take this 32 days. Because 32 days, if you if you put, let's say, uh, 16 days. Yeah. After 16 days, it will be genuine investors. Then the policy that you're trying to design will be targeting the genuine investors. And that will be targeting something that is long-term. And then, you know, like, targeting something that is long-term is riskier. Yeah, but the short long-term now is does not emerge from a very... It emerges from choices, right? Because 30, now we can intuitively see, of course, two might be very short. Similarly, you could say when it comes to building plants and all, 32 days is also very short, right? I'm just trying to get a feeling for how does the 16 day window distinguish between a high and a short, long and a short term? Is there more, some more stronger empirical or theoretical grounding to come up with this window in some sense? So you can see if, let's say, the one I think you have to, this will offer the first glimpse and suggestions that to this particular country, hey, there's more to your currency movement here than just making an assumption it is due to the speculators. So then maybe you have to follow up with others and look at the fundamentals of the countries. This 
give the suggesting uh, potential that if you find something that is more short-term currency volatility here, like in India, for example, okay, and this is due to the speculators. And maybe after that, the Indian government, they intervene in the currency market to dampen the volatilities and stuff like that. Like Philippines, for example, is only under 16 days. So you don't have to worry so much about the fundamentals. But for countries, that when you see your volatility here extended up until 120 days, maybe you should be worried. It's not, it's not only due to the speculators' perception towards your country, but it can be also due to the fundamentals. But it can be, right? It could also it be that be. I have a very Correct. poorly regulated financial market, and that's why, for instance, the Philippines and India have Correct. very independent, I'm just making up a story, yeah. independent central banks, and they immediately react. Yeah. And so you see that it's dampened and short. In Mex for instance, and in Mexico and Indonesia, had nothing to do with the fundamentals being any differently affected. Yes. It just was crony capitalism with a poorly regulated financial market, and that's why it resulted in it lasting for Mexico 256 days and in Indonesia. Fundamentals, right? Can you say that again? Crony capitalism would be fundamentals, right? Because so speculators, they are not here for long term. They just come and sell and they take out the money as well. Okay, so my, yeah, yeah I mean, just gives uh, a suggesting finding to the regulators or to the policymakers that hey, don't just dismiss the currency movement in your market is due to the speculators. Go and look back at your fundamentals because at least from this wavelength analysis, it is suggesting that the move, the depreciations or whatever things that is happening in your currency market can be due to your fundamentals as well. So it can be the, uh, speculator, the speculators that prolong to the behavior of the genuine investors. I have a very basic question, and you seem to be to ignore that, that doesn't make sense. But I don't understand why you have time on both axes here. So let's say the, the shock yeah. is at 300, and then you can go 32 rows below, and that means it lasted, if it's red, it means the shock lasted for 32 days, right? Okay. And if, it, if you go 32 to the right, you're also moving 32 no, no, days, no. and if it's red there, what does that mean? Yeah, so because in the code, I, I am not sure how to change the time here to yeah. the date of it. So this is not the time. So you can take time. I am just not sure how in the code to yeah. replace it. Yeah. So for example, the period of 200 here, right? This is uh, in the March of 2020. Yeah. Okay, so March 2020 when COVID happened. Yeah. Okay. So in March 2020, okay. when the COVID happened here, okay. So you have the currency volatility heightens. Like the volatility, the currency of this Indian, yeah. uh, the Philippines peso, it went up above its normal trend. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And that was exhibited by this red dash. It happened immediately. Uh, up here is zero to four. Immediately, the red patch happened immediately at zero. So let's say the COVID 19 happened today. Yeah. So the WHO announced today. So immediately, the current currency volatility tightened and it lasted for four days. Okay, so on the right axis, I have, I, I still have time, but it's like um, how long when the event been? started, and then and then on the vertical axis, I have how long how yes, long correct. the repercussions lasted. Yes, That's correct. What it says. Mm -hmm. okay. correct. Correct. Right, sorry, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, so this one here, for example, from the fourth, uh, from the eight days after the event happened until the sixteen days. So it lasted from the eighth day after the current, the the COVID happened. So if from eight days, eight days later until sixteen days, that it lasted. This is the period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this tells me like an event that started on the day four hundred would have lasted, would have had no impact on the on the volatility for the first eight days, and then from eight to 16, it would have done something. Yes, correct. Like yeah, correct. So this is the period, yeah. And can I also mm. ask you another thing? Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. So for instance, I'm just trying to understand that. Now, at least thanks to Simona, at least we understand how the graphs are plotted, but let's think about interpretation also, no? Like if I was to now look at Malaysia, and now if I was to take your story to be interpreted as you said, we can, so let's think about Malaysia and Philippines. You see that Malaysia, the shock lasts much longer. The same, this 200 day shock, that is the COVID shock. This is uh, as so compared to the Philippines one, which you would. It's 32 days actually. 
the Philippines, this uh, Philippines is about like. Ah, uh, sorry, days. Indonesia. Then let's take Indonesia. it as, as a different, you know, yeah. 128 related to just a 16 or 20 or whatever day period. So now, according to your interpretation, it would mean there was something fundamentals were being of concern in suggesting. Indonesia. Yes, suggesting, no, related to Philippines. What kind of facts do you have to back this up? Did much more foreign direct investment get pulled out of Indonesia now when you look in the in this, where they had this, some other reasons that they were such much more vulnerable to supply chains related to Philippines? I'm just trying to see if this is how we want to interpret it. Yes, it's yes, nice to print so, it. No? Yes. Next step that we did was that, could this be because of the country of origin shocks? Could this pattern is due to the cold movement with the Chinese yuan and the Russian ruble. So we run wavelet coherence. And this one here is a sample of the wavelet coherence here. And you can see uh, Indonesia is not here, but Malaysia is here. Okay. Uh, so whatever patch that is due to countries itself is already gone. I mean, whatever component, whatever part of the patch that is due to the country itself is gone. So this is the dynamic co-movement of emerging market prices with the Chinese one, the co-movement, the cross-correlations. And this is the influence of the, not influence, I would say, is the cross-correlations, that currency with the Chinese one. So you have cross-correlation, you have correlation that is, uh, in a normal time, is this level. But when it shows the red, certain period of time, it is above this normal period, this normal values. And this is what it shows here. Okay, the cross correlation heightens, like for example, in the case of Malaysia here, during the period of the COVID is here, but then it is more apparent here during the period of the Russian Ukraine war. This is cross correlation. I am not saying that Chinese yuan is causing this to happen, no. Mm -hmm. This is only the movement of the, this currency with the Chinese yuan. And during certain period here, it is above the normal trend. And somehow during this period here, oh sorry, during the uh, COVID, uh, during the Russian Ukraine war here, is more prevalent. The red flash is more compared to the uh, the COVID nineteen period. It just means that the, the, the cross correlations here with the Chinese yuan, Malaysia ringgit, for example, here is higher during the uh, Russian Ukraine war here. Okay, and then so we. So this one here give us, can this heighten volatility here, heighten cross correlation here because of the countries of origin shocks. Okay, but we don't know because it's only showing the core movement. So we did the same thing as well. We look at the core movement with the Russian ruble. And so these are the period, again, the same interpretation as well. This is the time when it happened. This is how long that it takes for that cross correlation or cross co movement to be higher than its normal value. What is the error represent? Okay, so the error means that which one that reacts first is either the Russian ruble that will go beyond the normal value or uh, the mission that go normal beyond the normal value and then followed by the other one. So which currency that is going to react first? They do react. Oh, today Chinese yuan uh, is volatile, and today also Malaysian ringgit is going to be volatile. No, so maybe today Chinese yuan is volatile above its normal value, but Malaysian ringgit will only be volatile a few days later. You mean not? So the arrow show, showing which one that responds first, which one that becomes more volatile first, and then the other one is going to follow suit. So let's say the arrow going up. Mm -hmm. uh, is it, uh... The, the longer error means something else. No, 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 no. Can I add something? Yeah. yeah. Add? Basically, these arrows, the upside, downside, yeah. diagonal, upward diagonal, downward diagonal, all of these have different meanings. Mm. So basically, overall, this is the co-movement between the currencies. Okay. So like in this case, she is going to tell the uh, co-movement between Russian rubble and let's say the Malaysian ringgit. So the downward arrows show that the Malaysian ringgit, uh, Malaysia. This one is Russian ruble. So the Russian ruble first, in my state. Yeah. Yes. So if it's downward here, that means the Russian ruble that react first. The volatility uh, comes from Russian ruble first. Yeah. So, yeah. That's the co-movement between the currencies. That whether they are co-move with each other. Because it's dynamic. So it is not contemporaneous. That means 
today and today yeah mm-hmm. but now you're already and you started off being careful by saying i'm going to plotting for relational and now you're already getting into kind of Dynamic. which moves first yeah. Yeah. and that given this dynamic setup it's almost impossible to say which moves first right this is just like running no you can run it you just need to calculate the correlate the dynamic correlations with the instead of like today and today i'm going to calculate the correlations between today yeah, and yeah but when do we start today right and yeah, the previous day yeah so you can calculate the correlations right but you don't need to have the same time period within today russian ruble and today malaysian ringgit right i want to calculate this lag effect but this can be the leading effect you know how we run the econometrics we have the lagging factors and we have the leading factors yeah but that's why we consider like once we have auto correlation we don't we can't say what causes what right anymore yeah, yeah correct so that's why we control this again it gives you the suggestive result can this be uh due to the this cross flow movement is it due to the country of origin shocks or is it due to something else so then when we control for global factors like global factors we control for the four global factors that i mentioned earlier the gold volatility the oil volatility the sea volatility itself and we control for the um treasury yield and we found that okay so when you find that that big patch already becomes small like this the big patch that you got just now it becomes small like this when you control for this gold volatility so actually that reactions that heighten cross correlations that you have is not because of the country origin shocks they were both reacting to this gold volatility that's why the red patch can become small first they were moving together and you think that maybe is this due to the country of origin shocks but when you control for the global factors that cross correlations is reduced to only the small patch so you realize that okay uh so you okay so this is what from the graph just now that i put it in the table so the during the covid-19 crisis which of these countries that experience heightened volatility that last less than 32 days and which one that have more than 32 days and then during russia you can more which one that has less than 32 days and which one that has more than 32 days and then um Okay. Then okay, I know that this one is a bit small, but this one just shows that when you take the cross correlations of the Chinese yuan and the emerging market currencies, which one that react first, and how long is that reaction? So we have mostly sixteen to sixty four days, mostly sixteen to sixty four days. Okay, and then ah uh, finally, when we control for our volatility indices. we find that the volatility indices here except for the egyptian pound and the russian ruble here the volatility indices here actually uh the one that triggers the heightened cross correlation movements because the big patch becomes small patch when we control for this volatility okay so that means when it is not the currency depreciation is not um due to the country of origin shocks in the case in this case it is china and russian ruble but it is more whether that shocks can affect the global volatilities or not or global volatilities also somehow become more volatile and so that is the one that caused the cross correlations to heighten the red patch to appear so in other words it is not so much of the country of origin shocks but it is more of the global volatility factors that contribute to this heightened cross correlations of the country because these are resources that are not available to this country that you were studying they cannot um, no they can what do i guess these global factors you can control it well if i was a very big oil producer mm-hmm. then i am controlling it right if the i am the, if i was so that would for for instance mm-hmm. no or if i was a um, very big gold producer or for instance depends on whatever resource you're looking that's why i was asking these are resources which the country themselves are okay. insignificant contributors to earth and that's why they are exogenous to them so so when you go back to indonesia for example they are one of the largest oil producers in the world okay so that makes sense it uh, it offers something that it, to the currency movement is not only to the speculators but then something to do with the fundamentals as well but fundamentals that relate to their oil volatility 
yeah, but then it's not just a global shock, right? I'm a big contributor. It's, I'm not a price taker anymore is all I mean to say, right? If I'm, mm -hmm. when we are, if there are, if I have significant market power because I'm a very large contributor, so then you would assume then that, that kind of analysis of controlling for it does not really help us, right? Because it's kind of endogenous to that country in, yes. in the question, right? Because it's image pockets, right? Image pockets, yeah. And I think even if you take, for example, the OPEC countries as well, like Saudi Arabia and stuff, and we included it, it's very difficult because their currency is pretty much like stagnant. I mean, it's, there's no volatility. I think they pack it to maybe the US dollar or something. Mm. Okay. So the conclusions. So emerging market currencies are prone to pure contagion within days, and this is due to the speculators, and some extended into the long run, and this is due to the fundamental base contingent by GDP investors. But again, so <laughs> maybe first Augustine can yeah. go ahead. Just, just a question. In this result, are you controlling for other variables that are already well documented in the literature that can be drivers of exchange rates? For example, um, interest rate differentials with the, the US monetary policy rate or oil prices in the case of oil mm -hmm. producer yeah. countries like Malaysia? These results are already controlling for this, or, or, or not at all? So the last one, when we control, right, the last one when we control, you can see that um, uh, when we control, you see, the, there's no more red thing at the beginning. Okay. So when we control for the all volatility, uh, sorry, this one is, I think, the all volatility, yeah. So there's more red one at the beginning. Because the red one is only short-term speculators that come in. They're not going to be affected by these fundamentals of the country or the oil volatility. So they're just coming in to trade really quick and then just pull out. So you see, this all the initial, the red patches at the beginning that happened, it all disappeared when you control for the oil volatility. Same thing as well, when you control for the US Treasury yield, when you control for the global world. Uh, so for example, in Malaysia, I think when you were not controlling, you have like a huge bottom, uh, in, the, in the bottom right, yeah, but this is yep. not significant. Okay. Mm, this is not significant. You see, this one is when you control for the oil volatility. You see, the red patches become like small. Uh, this one is the with the Chinese one. So initially, when you run with the Chinese one, you see, this is the red patches, right? No, but this is with the Russian government. Uh, sorry, Russian. Yeah, right, okay. yeah, with the Chinese one, you see, this red patches is here. Right, the cross correlations okay. with the Chinese one without controlling anything. Okay. So when you control, for the uh, yes, yeah. So when you control for the gold volatility, it becomes like this. What about the first set of exercises you showed us, which was to this is to these events, right? That you were talking about contagion from these yeah. events. That means this one here, it already filtered out the short term speculators. The which short term speculators. That means the, because there's no more the short run patches here. The, there is no more pure contingent now. We're looking at the fundamentals based contingent. And when but that's kind of tautological, right? You know, because your definition of this is speculator is defined by this, and then you interpret it as that again. So that's kind of, to me, I don't know, something troubles me about this way you set it up, you know, like because it's kind of by definition, and then you define, and then you say they are go after 16 days, so there are no speculators. but. It's kind of, yeah, you see what I'm trying to, yeah. trying to say? It's, this doesn't emerge from any fundamentals. What is a speculator? It's kind of a window which is arbitrarily fixed. And then you say, hey, the window is not there, so there must be no speculators, you know? Which is, yeah, maybe we can talk about it later, but I'm, still I'm not able to wrap my head around how I can reach this conclusion in this manner, but yeah. I, I have, I think, more general question about the contagion thing. I'm wondering just how much can we learn about market or financial contagion from a setting of a contagious disease, no? Because COVID itself was spreading across the globe. Yeah. And then you would see correlations that are not really because of financial contagion, but just because some countries some months or weeks later got mm -hmm. COVID and then react yeah. independently to that, maybe also because of speculators in those countries. Then. Yeah. And then you would see the correlation and contagion, but it's actually, actually like, disease contagion that then plays out differently in each country. I'm wondering, can you somehow say something about how you separate the effects of like, there's a market being contagious, like contagions going through markets and contagions, contagions going through health, like 
Is this somehow? Yeah, because with this one is the this is the value of the currency in the market, right? Mm -hmm. So it is really determined by the supply and demand. So if there are things that you mentioned, like okay, this is due to the health, this is due to the other factors and stuff like that, market would have already factors in, and they have an equilibrium in the market. Okay, so but here we don't, we don't, uh, we, I think well, I suppose that you can run an analysis and look at the various decomposition, for example, of this volatility, how much it comes from the COVID-19 cases within the country, and how much of it comes from the you know, volatility of the market itself. We yeah, can. But yeah. here we did, so we started out by looking at the volatility of the currency movement for this emerging market. We started out with that, looking at the volatility, heightened volatility above its normal, normal value. And then we find that some, for some countries, the volatility heightened is for short period. For some countries, it is for long period. Okay, and for short periods, we say that this is due to the speculators attack. And for long term, if I say short term here, it extends to the long term. Again, you may not like it, but we say that it is due to the genuine investors. And then after that, we cut, we move on from this volatility for each particular country. We look at this volatility along with the volatility of the countries of origin shocks. So that volatility movement with the Chinese run volatility movement, are they somehow any cross correlations or not? Are they influencing each other or not? So that is the wave rate coherence. And we find that, well, there are red flags that appear here, right? That means these two, their, pro their correlations heightened, but we don't know whether this heightened is due to the that country of origin shocks, or is it because these two are reacting to something bigger? Okay, because so should you be worried if let's say something happened to China? No, I think this finding is saying that you shouldn't be worried if something is happened to China unless something to have happened to China, and then at the same time, the global factors are also being interrupted, then it will affect you. So if it, something happened to Russia, do you need to worry about it? Even though when we look at the cross correlations, there is the red patch there, the heightened period of cost correlations. But should you be worried about what happened in Russia? No, unless that thing has an effect or somehow um, you know, something happened at the global levels. So country origin shocks do not contribute much to these cross correlations. Actually, they're both reacting to the global factors. So that was what... Uh, so, Rian, and, and just uh, so you are not controlling for movements in the US interest rate because that's uh, also like a global. We need the US uh, Treasury yield actually. Okay. Yeah, US Treasury yield. So, we have the US Treasury yield here, the DNX. We have the uh, all volatility, the volatility index itself, and the gold volatility. Okay. So, then Chinese yuan and Russian ruble has minimal effect on emerging market currencies, but it is more dominated by the global factors. So intervention in the forex market, it can be costly and it can deplete international reserves and it can bear other negative consequences because you're running out of your international reserve. So ensuring other type of shock absorbent tools to defend currencies in the short run uh, and then strengthen the macroeconomic fundamentals to prevent long-term contagion. So that is all what I have. Thank you. I have a question on the conversation. Can I make Yes, yes, for sure. Uh, yeah, the conclusion I did in my thoughts is right. Yes. Uh, no, no, particularly in, in, in foreign exchange interventions. Like, yeah. how this analysis can inform the, the, the central banks on, on when it's convenient to intervene and when it's just very, very costly to do it and they're just going to lose a lot of reserves. Like, how, how can we use this analysis to say, like, in these cases where, where, where the, the shock is not too long or, I mean, uh, how this analysis could inform the, uh, the uh, foreign exchange intervention policy? Because the speculators, so if you see, the speculators, they react immediately. And it can last, you know, I think four days, 16 days or so, right? And speculators, um, with the speculators, because it's a short term, they come in and stuff like that. So you don't really need to worry and depend too much. I would say, this is my personal opinion, it's unnecessary to use your forex reserve to defend and fight against the speculators, okay? Because eventually, they will realize that, hey, we're just like following the movement of others, this is herding behaviors, well, things actually okay within that country, so let's go back. 
you don't have to worry. But then when you start to intervene, when your short-term volatility here is not dampening at all, it is not subsiding, it's prolonged to your long term. So that is suggesting something, not only the speculators are reacting here, the genuine investors are also reacting here. So if you're going to defend your currency without taking the measures, again, because we say it is due to the fundamentals, you have to go and investigate what are the fundamentals that actually drive. It can be political economy. It can be because, you know, like, uh, yeah, political economy of a country, perhaps, that make, you know, genuine investors do not see in the long term it's going to be fine. So they start to pull out. So if you're trying to intervene as well in the market, without supplementing with other policies is not going to work. Because the genuine investors, they're here for long term. So you, what you're trying to do is only depleting your international foreign reserves, but you're not doing anything. So you need to have some form of policy mix. Mm -hmm. And the, yeah, but because it's fundamentals, right? So fundamentals is really quite hard to change. Uh, you need something bold to change it. Okay, so I think that is uh, that is all for me. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I guess this is perfect timing. Uh, I just ask if there's anybody online who has any kind of a question. Super. So thank you everyone and I guess uh, we have some coffee outside yeah. uh, and we can carry on with our chat uh, outside. Thanks so much sure. for that interesting thank so. Yeah.